I want to introduce the people up front. Chris Harnack is with Volunteers of America. She is the director of the mental health clinics, and she will act as facilitator. The person in the middle you've already heard from, Jen McShane, and it was her movie that we just finished watching. And I am so honored to be able to introduce Mona Graves to you, who was featured in the movie. And Now, I know people in Minnesota say that we talk funny. You ain't heard nothing yet. <laughs> so, I'll give you these three women. Well, I would love to start and ask you, Jennifer, just what inspired you to do such an amazing movie? Well, thank you. Um, I, I guess I was inspired by Sister Elaine, the woman who founded it. and. Um, I, I, I always have to sell, poor Mona's heard this 5,000 times, but I always have to tell this um, line that she said to me, and of course she said it off camera, and I spent like years trying to get her to say it again on camera, and she never would. Um, but she said to me, you know, it's amazing to have the Vatican and the Department of Corrections pissed at you at the same time. <laughs> And I thought, this is my kind of woman. Like she, and, and, and you know, when we're talking about these kind of issues, you need a visionary. And she was the visionary for Bedford. And she just didn't understand hearing no. <laughs> like she honestly didn't understand. Like why, you know, she just, it was, it was all good to her and it was all about love. So um, she was my inspiration. And I think um, I'm attracted to telling stories that I feel might not be told in a thoughtful way with nuance. And I think, you know, the little we see about incarceration on our um, televisions and are pretty exploitive for the most part. I mean, there's some exceptions, but in general. And I just thought this piece of the puzzle had not been told properly. Um, and I'm a mother myself. And I thought, you know, there are universal themes about loving your child and your child loving you that, you know, as Sister Lane says in the film, bars can't separate that. So that was my inspiration. And then I was blessed to find like five amazing women. And, and as I said in the beginning, I had always planned to have three and then you know, there was like no way my editor, you know, she was like famous for cutting scenes and she's like, we can't cut, we can't cut. So um, anyway, that's how it happened. Well, I'm sure you have many, many reactions and emotions and questions for both Jennifer and Mona. So I'm taking questions from the audience. Yes. Me? Oh, yeah. Well, um, for me, it was, it, oh, the question was the, um, that the uh, person heard that we did a screening inside Shakopee last night, and we did. And I have to say, I'm actually feeling kind of emotional about it. It was a, a personal goal of mine to get it into as many women's facilities as I could. And uh, I've been kind of chipping away at that, and we've shown it to the parole board in New York State. We've shown it to lots of groups of judges, and we've made some really impactful, you know, little steps. Uh, but I, I thought it was really important to show it to other incarcerated women. So for me, it was huge. Uh, that was amazing. And the fact that Mona could be there with me to speak about her experience just was unbelievable. I'll let her talk about that. I mean. You know, I'm usually on the other side, and to be in a prison was, it was just amazing. And my purpose, Emily, is to give these women hope, you know, that if I could do it, they could do it, you know? And it was just very, very emotional and overwhelming for me, you know, afterwards. The woman, there was a terrific audience. I mean, it was just incredible. And, you know, there was little different things, you know. Where I come from, prison is very strict, very confined, feel of barbed wire. You know, I live in, so I went to Shakopee, it was like a college campus. <laughs> but then what really disturbed me is that I heard there's no contact. You know, the women cannot touch. And, you know, I felt, in a way, I felt kind of guilty, whereas where I came from, you know, I had all those privileges where you could see us rolling on the floor with our children and kissing and touching. And so that I felt guilty about. I felt also guilty that, you know, I'm free and they're still in prison. So that was, this was the first time I ever visited a prison. So it was really emotional for me. And I gave the ladies a lot of advice. You know, afterwards, you know, they were like inspired. And so it was self-rewarding for me to know that I just gave them a glimpse of hope. And I just reminded them. You know, one woman comes to me and she says, 
you know, I need to ask you a question. You know, I have a 13-year-old daughter. I'm here, and, you know, I live in Maine, and I see her once a month, and she's 13, and I'm really starting to have problems. And I said, listen, whether you were in Maine with her or you're here at 13, that's the problem. <laughs> she's 13, you know, and I told her, you know, I just assured her that everything is going to be all right, you know, and that you could be a dedicated, nurturing mother no matter where you're at. I think that's a real takeaway that we're trying to get through to people, no matter where they're coming from on this spectrum of the issue, is that you can be a dedicated parent and giving that opportunity, even if you're in this extraordinarily difficult situation, only benefits the child, the parent, and society. Like, it's just win, win, win. People heard there was a film, and so, and for some reason the guards looked the other way that day. There were 30 women in the room, just jammed in this room, and we watched the whole thing from front to back. So someone who used to be incarcerated there and I co-lead a discussion group on Saturday afternoons, all of them were so incredibly moved. There were so many tears. And one of the things that they said they noticed was that this is the first time they'd ever heard anyone say, you can be a good mother and still be incarcerated. Um, thank you. I was just curious, that piece that you just brought up right now about the contact, I was just curious, in terms of replicating this center to other places, um, could you speak a little bit about the policies that would either inhibit that or that maybe are unique to the... Bedford that allow that to happen? I think that a critical role, and what happened, it was so unique about Bedford is that, you know, first of all, you need administration that's gonna be supportive. And there's a big difference when you're in a maximum security prison with people that are doing a, a lot of time and a medium security. If you notice in, in, in Albion, when I was transferred to Albion, like, that was like a whole nother world, you know, that, and when you have women that are doing a lot of time, they, they seem more focused. You know, they wanna do the right thing and they wanna get out, so, I came into prison, I was arrested in 1985. I was shipped upstate in 1987. I just got out in 2011. And um, so in terms of your question is that you need a lot of supportive. And what was so unique about us is we had a lot of women. And when you have a, a group of individuals, whether they're women, men, you, when you have a group of women, human beings that have a passion for something and that want to make it happen, miracles happen. And that's exactly what happened. If you look in Bedford, all the programs are run by inmates. All the inmates facilitate everything, except for like, of course, answering the phones and stuff like that. But I just think that, you know, it could be done when you have people have a passion for it, people that, you know, see it, there's a concern and there's a need in it, and that's where it takes place. And I think there was a perfect storm with Bedford because they happened to have a, a warden, a superintendent at the time, who really was just strangely open to the idea. She just thought, you know what? She kind of could think a little bit outside the realm. Um, you had Sister Elaine, who just was like a dynamo, who just wouldn't hear no. Um, and then you have a community around the prison who home hosts these children overnight when they stay. That's a big piece of the puzzle, which we realized last night when I was at Chacope, I was stunned to hear that they had ever had children spending the night there. So it's just interesting, in some ways, you know, we see no fence around Shakopee, but they can't hug, hug their child. So it, it, there was just a very interesting contrast in, uh, going on between the two experiences. But I think you, you do need the administration to be on board, and you need a visionary who just um, can't hear no. And also, I think what Mona touched on, when it's a max, and I notice in Minnesota, it seems like most of the prisons, or at least in Shakopee, you have a mix of a minimum to maximum, so that changes the dynamic a little bit. At max, a lot of people have a lot of time, and so they're a little more invested, I think, focused. in focused on making this right work, thing. trying to do the right thing, and you're stuck there. So you, unless, you know, when, once you get your head in the game of making this better for your child, a lot can happen that's positive, and it might be a little trickier when, you, like in a, when, when the population is ch uh, changing a lot. I, for example, when I got to Albion, I tried to, you know, at Bedford, I had, like, for example, I had administration that supported any kind of program that I, you know, I would 
put together curriculum and they would support it and they would give me a, actually the, the class that I actually put the curriculum together which is called Parenting from a Dentist in Distance it's a very intensive parenting class it actually starts from your own childhood until you you know decision where you were in terms of life where you decided to become a parent whether it was an accident that just happened and it goes all the way through before prison and after prison parenting so what happened they actually encouraged it it got to the point where they mandated it they made it a paid module they paid inmates to go to this class as if it was an educational department, you know. And it was a class for 16 weeks, five days a week, three hours a day. So that's the kind of support that, we, you know, we had. And I think the correctional officers and everyone you talked to realized the dynamic of the whole facility was improved because the women were more focused on being their best parent they could achieve to be. And the children just added a sense of life to the place that um, is hard to deny. We have a question from Greater Minnesota for Mona. Actually, two questions. What are you doing for a living now? And I'm were poor. You, <laughs> and were you able to find employment with your criminal record? It's interesting. Um, it's very, very difficult to find employment. Like, when you get out, and you know, it's funny that Anithia mentions it in a movie, she says, you know, I'm just anxious to work. What happens when you're incarcerated like me for 20, over 24 years, you know, you want, you want to take care of yourself. You don't want everybody taking care of you anymore. You know, you want to show the world that you could do it. And they throw you out in New York State, they give you $40 and they just throw you out of prison. And if you do not have a family member, you have to parole to where you were arrested. If you do not have a family member that you could parole there to, you're going to shelter there. Even if you have a family Even member Even if you have a family member in another, another county, you can't. Like, I'm from Queens. If I didn't have somebody in Queens, I had somebody in Brooklyn, I would have to go to a shelter in, in Queens. That's just the law. That's the way it is. Um, I forgot the question. I'm sorry. A job. Oh, a job. <laughs> oh, God. That's why I forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I got out and I was so anxious to work and work and work. And it's really, I went to every federally funded agency. And unfortunately, I was told, oh, we just had a budget cut. You know, you just got out at a bad time. You know, we have the Fortune Society. We have the Osborne Association. So I did reach out to all these places. And I am college educated. And I just couldn't get a job. I started working for a friend of my family who really took advantage of me. I was working 60 hours a week for $10 an hour. No lunch break, no microwave, no refrigerator. I did that for 11 months until it got to the point where I said, you know what, I don't care that I don't have a job, I don't care that I have no money, I can't be treated like this anymore. And I met this incredible man who owns a dental handheld instrument, stainless steel instrument company, so I sell dental instruments, but he doesn't know that I have a criminal record yet. I'm afraid to tell him. But she's making a lot of sales, so <laughs> she is, she is. So I think he will be fine with it, actually. I mean, I have a passion. I would love to do advocacy work. It's just that it's just not often where I'm at. We have another a few questions from um, Greater Minnesota. This is from someone at Center City Housing. And I don't know if you all can answer this question or not. Do men's prisons have play areas for the children when they come to visit, as was shown in the, the movie at the women's prison? And if not, why not? Actually, in New York State, it's becoming more familiar. They are replicating the children's center. It's not as broad, and they don't actually have. And like Jen had mentioned, uh, Bedford Hills is located in Westchester County, a very, very wealthy neighborhood. It's like Chappaqua, you know, the Ecotona. So, it's very healthy, a lot of programs you know, uh, done from volunteers come in and do a phone work. Like she said, the families host the kids, so they, they need that kind of support. They do have little play areas. And I'm feeling kind of selfish now because the prison, the men's prison used to always write and they always wanted a copy of my curriculum. And I would send them copies of the curriculum because they wanted to do parenting classes. So one day they contact me and they're like, Mona, you know, we want to change it a little. So I felt really offended because me and my friends put this together. I'm like, are you kidding me? How could you think you're going to change my curriculum? So they wanted to make it masculine. Everything she, they wanted he, you know, everything feminine, they wanted masculine. And so it took me like two years to give them the okay. I just felt like it was so personal, you know, and there's a lot of pictures of us and our kids. 
And um, I did share it, but yes, it is, it is evolving, and they are offering more parenting classes in the men's prisons. Yeah, and sometimes, like Mona said, it's not as comprehensive. So they'll have maybe story corner, like read to your child. Um, they'll have some play areas. Um, but I have to say, you know, Bedford is unusual, and uh, budget cuts kind of are actually starting to endanger Bedford too. So uh, it's it's really a day to day situation for all these places. But it is can be replicated. I'm convinced. I think one thing that struck me too was the difference between the beautiful the center, the family center, and then and then the waiting time, the 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 experience of having to wait to get in there, mm -hmm. yeah. was almost like, you know, such a different experience. Yeah. Yeah. And and as as a filmmaker, I was always trying to let them get them to let me film wherever I wanted, <laughs> which that was always a little bit of a. <laughs> They didn't really know how to deal with me. But um, because I, cause I really didn't want to leave this impression that the prison was the children's center. Um, so, and I hope we were able to convey that it, you, know, you, you are where you are. But um, so it is kind of an interesting, and Sister Lane really speaks to that beautifully, I think, about you know, the cheery aspect of one part of the prison as opposed to the reality of where you are every night. It's like the woman last night would tell me that they live in rooms and they have these tundras and the kids get to sleep there. And I said, wow, you know, that's amazing. You know, that's really fortunate. I said, you know, I had a cinder block cell for 21 years where my toilet and my sink is connected. You know, where I go to the bathroom is right above it I drink my water from, you know? So it was like, it's really different and unique, you know, the whole dynamic when you think about where you're at and stuff. And if you look at Albion, that was like, it's like another world, you know? This is, it's located in a little town, really, really upstate New York, next to Canada, where the whole, the whole place actually exists in that prison. Everybody's related, you know, the cousins, the brothers, the fathers, the grandfathers, all officers or the maintenance men or anything. And what happens is that, you know, here I am, I thought I was gonna make changes. What I did do is that I know a lot of laws about Department of Corrections. So I was like, I know what I'm entitled to. I know what the women are entitled to. So I, one thing I could do is everywhere I went, I could make changes. I couldn't make new changes, but I would enforce the things that we were entitled to. So they really try to get me out of there a lot. <laughs> but I felt good because I did make a lot of changes. You know, I knew what the women were entitled to, and I knew what was taking place and what should be taking place. So. Um, Albion, you know, I really wanted to get things, and I got the books, you know, I wanted tapes, you know, get donated. What happens is that it, we had this incredible, un, unique children's center who, a lot of the relationships between the caregiver and the, and the incarcerated person, the, the relationships are already strained prior to incarceration. You know, it's just fortunate if they have somebody that does take their child. And the person looks at it like this, you know what, I'm feeding this child, this child's going to school, he's got a roof over his head. You know, I'm not hiking this kid to Bedford. You know, so they look like their job is done. So you have these wonderful advocates that come in and they, they create this wonderful relationship where the kid's finally coming to visit. Then they get put on a bus to Albion and they can't even get a free phone call. And then who suffers? The child. You know, so I went up there and I tried to do things and you know, try to understand. They just don't want to hear it. And what they would, one thing I did stop, what they were doing is they, the, the population up there is so small that they were counting the inmate population on their census to get funds for the community, to get like a 10 board chair. So what I did stop is that we started getting counted in the community where we were arrested. So they wouldn't get that fund anymore. Mona, um, you might have fun with this question. In the film, you talk about how you never got to see a CD player and a few other things. Since being out, what is the best or one of the coolest things you've discovered? Oh, wow. I, I don't know if you can count Gabby. It might, she might oh. count. Yeah, my granddaughter's birth on my phone. <laughs> She calls me after she gets out, the day she's released, she calls me and she goes, oh my God, they really? just showed me the birth of my granddaughter on a phone. Uh, yeah, so I think the most challenging thing, and this may sound ridiculous to you guys, was the TV remote control. My son, you know, I paroled to my son's house because I had to go to, to where I was released, else I would have wound up in a shelter. So I paroled to my son. So I really didn't want to live with my son. You know, he's grown and stuff, but he wanted me there. And this is funny, but it's not funny. 
But my son has like all, he, can't, he has OCD, the oldest one, so he can't have the wire showing. So like everything's in a closet somewhere. So like to change the channel, meanwhile there's 500 channels. I can't even, I don't even know how to put the television on, you know? And he told me, I don't know, maybe a hundred times that I had to do this thing. Like if he would go out and like, I just couldn't ask him anymore. And I just broke down in tears. You know, I felt so helpless. That I couldn't turn on the TV without calling him. <laughs> and then he looked at me. He, they looked at me like, I don't know if it was because I was a murderer. You know, my kids were young, you know. Actually, Travis was actually born while I was incarcerated. It doesn't say that in the movie, but Travis was born inside. He'll, he's 25. He's an engineer now, and he's, he's amazing. They're both amazing. But um, my son, Justin, would always look at me, because they used to meet in the visiting room. They used to meet on trailer visits where, you know, it was a long period of time. You know, now I'm living with him, and I'm just always talkative. I'm just very hyper. I always have to be busy. And he'd be like, Ma, relax, calm down. You know, just because you just got out. You got to calm down. You got to sit down. You got to rest. And then I would always feel him looking at me. And I used to get, I say, wow, why does he do that? You know, I'd be in, I'd be in the kitchen, and I could feel he'd be like this. <laughs> so I started to think he was afraid of me. <laughs> and I was like, wow, you know, maybe because I was a murder. I don't know why he's staring at me. Like, But it, what it was is that he just didn't know me. He really didn't know me, you know? Questions out there? Um, so you mentioned before the, the, we saw the film that you couldn't involve any kids that were in foster care and because of releases and all that kind of thing. And um, I'm very thankful that the five women did get to have their children visit them. And I'm wondering, I would think that um, if children are with their mothers and there's no relatives for them to go to, that they would go to foster care and how are visits facilitated for kids that are in foster care, and how does that happen? Well, thankfully, because of the advocates that you see, you know, the woman who kind of facilitates the teacher conference, there is a group of advocates that are all volunteers, and you can come in, and they really worked hard to get those court-appointed visits to happen, um, and were remarkably successful, I have to say. But again, you know, you need that resource there, um, and that's hard to achieve. But. They, 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 it happened more than I thought it would, to be honest with you. I was really surprised that they, um, and like Mona said, oftentimes the caregiver was feeling resentful, as a foster family might be, like, we're already doing a lot here. You know, now you want me to go schlep up an hour and sit there all day, and you know, it's a lot to ask. Uh, but yeah, so it was a tricky thing. I was hoping to bring that into the film because it is a reality, but it just was impossible for me. Mona, who was the caregiver in your situation that brought the children to visit you? My elderly mother and my stepdad. Yeah, actually, it was interesting because um, when I had Travis, she thought that the welfare was going to take my baby. You know, there was such an age gap between... My mother had me when she was 41 years old. So there was an age gap there, never mind the age gap between her and my children. So she had came, she had went to the hospital with a bunch of nuns. My mother was in a convent when she was young. <laughs> she's, she's Roman Catholic from Ireland. So um, she, you know, wind up at the hospital with a bunch of nuns and just took the baby home. Mona, since your, since your release in 2011, um, I'm looking at the community impact that you've had while you were incarcerated. What have you done volunteer-wise and impact since you've been released? Absolutely. The only thing I've done is that I attend screenings and I try to raise funds for the children's center. Which is a ton. That's not an only. <laughs> That's it. You know, I would love to do it. You know, I just have no, no options, really. I could barely, you know, work. We have, a qu we have a question from Duluth. Can you describe a part of your parenting group that was most helpful to the parents? I believe the most drastic part for my parenting group was probably our own childhood. And, and because I think that, you know, our old childhood, you know, it, it, it really affects how we parenting and our parenting skills. You know, there were women, we vowed to do, never do things like our mother or do them the same, and we find ourselves doing exactly what we said we wouldn't do or doing exactly the opposite of what we intended to do. So I think that our childhood had the most profound impact on our parenting skills and the environment we were in, in, in terms of when we decided to become a mother. A lot of times, no, no one decides. A lot of times, it's an accident. You know, a lot of times, it's not planned. So I think that was the most critical issue. For me, it seems um, 
I'm very, um, I admire you a lot. The, 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 the crime that you were involved in didn't seem to warrant the experience that you had or the length of. And how did you keep your spirit up, your positive attitude, your finding the purpose that you obviously found to do that amazing work? What year did you start the film? Well, basically, she started filming this film in 2006. By then, I was in prison for a very long time. My children is what kept me going. And, and to be honest with you, when I first went to prison, I was very young. I was very mad. You know, I was mad at the world. You know, I, I was never arrested before in my life. Um, I actually believed in the system. I believed that if I appealed my case, that I would, you know, they would really see the truth and how I had no intention to hurt anybody. Um, and then in 2007, the year, the law that I was sentenced under, which is the register law, I don't know who's familiar with that, in 1985, to be convicted under the register law, you had to just be found guilty of a reckless act. And my behavior was reckless. I was in a car, on drugs, didn't prevent this accident. I didn't even know what happened. I, you know, I woke up in a hospital under arrest. So in 2006, the law gets rebutated. They say, you know what, it's not fair. How could you convict somebody how could you have a jury decide on something that carries a minimum of one year and then someone, something that carries a minimum of 15 years? So what happened, they changed the law and they said, now it has to be a mental culpable state. So from when I went to the parole board, I had Supreme Court justices write letters saying, you know, if Mona Graves was convicted of this crime this year at this time under this law, she would not spend a day in jail. So that's how I got out a couple months early. Do you know what happened to the driver of the car? Actually, it's funny you mentioned that because I really didn't keep in touch with him. However, throughout the, he always wrote me and always said he was sorry for ruining my life and stuff like that. And then when I got home, I don't know how he got my address and he wrote me again and he's sorry for, he's been telling me that you know, since 1985. So the other day his brother contacts me and he says, you know, Frank got hit at the board. See, in New York State, if you have 20 to life, 25 to life, you have to do, we have no good time in New York State. You have to do that first number. So me, I had to do the first number before I was even considered for parole. Like here, the warden was saying, you do 10, you do seven years, you do the rest outside. It's not like that in New York State. So he just got hit at the parole board in October again. So he's been in since 1985. So he got hit with another two years. His brother asked me to send him my, my parole minutes. You know, what, and what happened, when I went to the parole board, I had no intentions of coming home. You know, my attorney said, you know you're not going home. We know you're not going home. But what you need to do is to go in there and generate a very strong record for an appeal. You know, he said, if you don't do that, Mona, I'm done with you. My parole hearing was the longest parole hearing in New York State. <laughs> it was 52 minutes. And it was the longest one in the Bayville Correctional Facility. You know, because I, I just was trying to put everything on paper because that's all you really got, you know, to work with. And so his brother just contacted me, and he's like, he wants my parole minute. So he got hit again at the board. We had an interesting experience. We showed the film to the parole board, um, and it was kind of wild, because two of them had actually, were the two that were, had released Mona, so it was, it was bizarre. Exactly, I went to a parole uh, screening at Lincoln Center in Manhattan, and the lady that released me, my parole commissioner, was in the audience. Could you tell me what was the most emotional part of making the film for you and the filmmaker? Oh, you know, I have to say, when I first started shooting, every single time I left, I was upset. Like when I walked out, because a little bit how Mona was talking about feeling last night, I'm leaving, they're not. There was a little bit of that, or I would just feel kind of unsettled. Um, Mother's Day, and also uh, the fact that uh, I, I, every single time I went back, I, it was like recreating the wheel to convince them why I had to. Um, film. They didn't seem to understand what I was doing in, for such a long period of time, which I understand on some level, you know. That's, um, but I, I think um, Lucrece, you know, Lucrece was the heart, you know, Mona is the uh, heart of the film and the, the sense of purpose, and uh, Lucrece was all about hope and love and start and keeping traditions and still when she says in that christmas scene you know even when i'm long gone i want you doing this and she you know none of us knew she was going to be gone um so that that still gets me emotional um 
but uh, yeah, it was a, it was quite a journey. And my kids, you know, it's funny they they've seen the film so many times that they now count my Honda Pilot in the film how many times they see it because it's parked like slightly. It should have been out of the shot, and it's not. And da -da. so all these crazy games, and they're like, "That's where you were on Christmas Eve, and that's where you were on Mother's Day," and so they like to really give it to me. Hey, th thanks so much for for your film. It really it, it was incredibly touching. Um, I mean, even after working with lots of families with, who have incarcerated family members, I just, I just was just so touched. Uh, and I, I wonder, as I watched, you know, your kids and some of the other kids uh, with their mothers, I wondered where their fathers were, and and were they ever involved? Were they ever helping? Uh, were they ever part of that system outside that could support you once you got once you got out? Well in, well, uh, okay. well, in the case of the film, um, most of the fathers, actually all of the fathers really in this scenario of the women I happen to be filming really were not involved. Um, and as a line that I'm stealing from either Mona or Bobby, somebody who always says at screenings, when, you know, when men go to prison, women visit them or marry them. And when women go to prison, men find another you know, girl. So um, the, you know, the visiting rooms are not as packed in the women's facility, I'll tell you that. Um, so they really weren't that much part of the picture, but I hear from uh, everyone I talk to that that is slowly changing, that there, it does seem to be an uh, uptick in involvement in terms of being caregivers, in terms of participating. Um, so, and also just from a, a kind of the story arc as a filmmaker, the story arc of the film, I really wanted the caregiver piece. I really wanted the generational piece because they are, just talk about unsung heroes and missing piece of the puzzle and all this stuff. I wanted their voices heard and I just knew it was gonna be, it was already a really crowded film. So I, I'm not sure I would have been able to include the dads too much. I was trying to make it more about moms, but they weren't really involved anyway. to get them in the picture mm -hmm. or to make it easier for them to be in the picture and not to walk or, right. or whatever happened. Yeah. And it was interesting because Bobby says she thinks part of the reason that it's improving is that we're making fathers more accountable about, you know, child support and, and being involved and, and also just as a society, fathers in general are more involved. And so there's a kind of a shift that way. Um, and you know, as I just wanted to touch on something you said about you, the fact that you work in, with this population and you were moved because when I made the film, I was kind of making it for people who I thought have, don't ever think about prison. I was kind of making it for soccer moms who love their children but don't realize that people in prison also have children um, and, and, or people just who don't think about the issue. I really want to illuminate it to people who don't understand the humanity that actually exists in behind bars. Uh, but I've been really struck by the fact that it's such a chord in, with people who are working and they say, that's authentic, that's what I'm living. So I appreciate hearing it. I was really intrigued by the prison nursery part, and I know, I mean, I've read a fair amount about prison nurseries, but there's not very many around the country. Do you know sort of how many there are? And um, there are not that many. Um, I, I should have the number. I used to know off the top of my head. I can't remember. Um, but they are, oh, God, oh gosh, I'm sure Deborah knows. But it, it, is, it is rare, I will tell you uh -huh. that. Seven, right? I th yeah. But there's three being built. Yeah. There, but I do think there are some states that are, are actually open to it. So it's interesting. Even Connecticut is considering it um, about adding one in Niantic. And so I think it's interesting. It is, and it's a touchy t topic um, because, you know, in terms of, you know, if given a choice between having a woman raise her child in the community in a kind of a supervised setting in the community, of course that's preferable. But... I have to say, there was amazing things happening in that nursery. And so. it's, it's amazing because, you know, at Bedford, I was there for so long, and people would come from all over the world just to look at the program. You know, I mean, somebody from Japan, Africa, you know, people that ran prisons in other countries. You know, they, they, they had, the, well, they hopefully they have the incentive of replicating the program, the nursery. I, I'll add that in Gig Harbor, Washington, they've had a nursery for 10 years. Yes, right. Up to three years. And in fact, so they've come, stay a long time. Yeah, and they've come to visit Bedford uh, too as well. And there's also a prison right across the street from Bedford called Taconic, which is a medium, and they have a nursery. They just closed it though. They did. Yeah. Oh. Is there anything, anything you can think of that would have helped your adjustment back to the family and then back to the population that you wish you would have had while you were, you know, while you were 
why you re before you're being it's, released? It's interesting, and I wish I could do something about it, is because, um, you know, in New York State, you know, you hear about all these federally funded programs for reentry and transition. And I would really like to know where the money's going, you know, because when I got out, I couldn't get any help. Nowhere, you know, in, in, in terms of job, you know, employment opportunities, in, ter in terms of just to have a function in society where I really don't know what's going on. You know, the world has advanced so much since I've been away. I needed to be, I had challenged one thing, and, and they started this new program in Bedford while I was there. It was for computer literacy. And I said, wow, that's great. You know, I'm going to get to learn how to use a computer. Unfortunately, the requirement was you had to be under 25 years to participate in this. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. You know, if anything, I'm the one, I'm going home. I need to know this, you know? <laughs> so I actually, actually took it to the court and said it was discrimination. And they had to program me into computer literacy. <laughs> um, and I just did it, you know, maybe so. And then I just left. I didn't stay involved because I really wasn't interested. But I just wanted to prove to them. <laughs> but to make a long story short is, you know, it really angers me that they mandate me to go to what's called ART, anger regression treatment, for like the last eight weeks that I'm incarcerated. It's a mandated program. I mean, if you don't go, they'll snatch your date to be released. And in there, I watch The Nutty Professor every day. You know, so like, the people that are in charge, anything looks good on paper. You know, they could show anything what they're doing on paper, but actually what is going on is not what they're saying, you know? I think that things have to be done like that in regards to, re in New York State, I don't know how it is in Minnesota, but in New York State, I don't know where the funds are going, but the, in, in regards to, if, one thing I must say, if you are HIV positive, they do have housing, they do have employment opportunities, so it is, you know, it is addressed in that sense. You know, if you have somewhere to go, you know, fortunately for me, you know, I didn't have to go to a shelter, and if I would have lived in a shelter, I could have went to certain places had I lived in a shelter, had more opportunities. But because I was paroled to a family member, I was excluded from those, you know, in regards to education opportunities and employment opportunities. I was kind of going to ask something along the same lines as to whether or not you felt that you were prepared at all for the transition. And, it was, and, it, and you somewhat answered that just now, but do you feel like... Um, did anyone talk to you about what it was going to be like? Were you ca caught totally off guard with how challenging and difficult it was emotionally? And Absolutely. did you ever flirt with the idea of I'd rather go back? I thought about it. Absolutely. It's much easier inside. And um, it's, it's unfortunate, you know, my, had I not had a supportive family, I probably would have went back to prison, you know, and had enough of my two children. What happened is I got thrown out into this world where... Here I was inside, I was so constructive and productive, you know, and a good member of society, I was doing great things, and I was confident, and then I just get thrown out into this world where I'm just, like, clueless, you know? And I became, to the point, I actually lost maybe 20 pounds in the first 60 days. That's how overwhelmed I was. So my family got me a therapist, I went for therapy. And the therapist tells me, you know what? You know, Mona, you know, it's okay, it's okay. Of course, I'm always crying, I was always crying. You know, I just couldn't deal with it, you know what I'm saying? And I was like, oh, it's okay for the cry. You know, you have social adjustment anxiety disorder. <laughs> and I said, what? He's like, yeah, you know, you have anxiety, uh, social adjustment disorder, and it's okay. And I said, but it's, how could it be okay if it's a disorder? No, it's not a disorder for you. It's, it's expected for you, you know, it's not a disorder for you. He said, but I'm going to give you some cervical XR or whatever. I never took it. Because while I was incarcerated, I took medication once and I'll never take it again. I think I gave me Melorel, 20, 20 milligrams of Melorel when I was in a segregated housing unit for an infraction and I went blind and had to get like four needles. So, you know, I mean, like, they just throw you out there and it's overwhelming. I mean, it's, it could be, I could see, I could literally see had I not had the moral support I had and the love for my children and, you know, if I wasn't going to do it for myself, I was going to stay strong for them. I mean, there's days where I break down often, but I would never let anybody know it, you know? I know I already asked a question, but I just think that that speaks so much to the importance of dealing with um, uh, 
when people get out of prison, their records and how that's shared and the opportunities that people are given when they apply for work. Because you have all of these amazing qualities and strengths. You should be teaching parenting programs. But because of your record, you can't. And that is a complete shame. Well, I have to say hats off to Minnesota about the box. Um, yeah, well done. I have a question about the teenagers. Like we saw a, uh, some of the young teenagers in the movie, but I'm wondering if the teenagers continue to visit throughout the program. It's interesting because my, you know, my two boys, their whole lives, and uh, me and a couple of my friends, we instituted a program which is called the Teen Program, which brings the teens up once a month. You know, with because other with other teens, and what happens, because the host families, they really have difficulty, you know, with teens, so we would raise funds, to, we would rent cabins, you know, they stay in a hotel, but we always had chaperone volunteers and stuff, so we initiated this program, and then, of course, I have a younger son, Travis, who wasn't a teenager, who, you know, wanted to come and want to come, so then we made the preteen program, <laughs> so, um, yeah, and, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing, because, my experience with my two boys is that when they get to a certain age, they, you know, they get their own identity, and you don't want them to feel guilty about it. They've been coming here all their life, and it's amazing. They don't want to disappoint you. Your kids just don't want to disappoint you. They're so resilient. And there was times where I had to tell my sons, you know, you got to promise me that if you can't make it this weekend, just don't feel guilty. And it got to the point where they were missing out on so much because they felt so responsible to having to come to see me. And meanwhile, I'm heart-wrenched feeling that they're missing out because they have to come see me. So it was like a tug-of-war, you know? And then they get older and they get the girlfriend, then mom's not that important anymore, you know? <laughs> then they bring the girlfriend to visit you, and then you get a little jealous, <laughs> and then you wonder why Justin didn't come next week, you know? But you, know, you just have to let them go. I, I asked all the kids who were involved in the, uh, the film, and some who didn't actually end up being in the film, but I asked all the kids when I would meet with them, what were the best things about the program, aside from seeing your mom? And every single kid said this number two answer always was, there's a way to get here, the bus. Like, somebody help me get here. And that was huge, because you can have the best program in the world, but if the child can't get to it. So that was always, and it did, almost didn't matter what age they were, they always said the transportation. And then the next thing was, the next answer, or the equally answered uh, next question uh, answer was um, coming with other kids. That was huge. Um, because it's great to come on a random visit and see mom with the grandmother or the other screaming child or the da da da. But to go with a bunch of other kids only. You're not going with the other relatives in your family. You're just going. So it's one on one time with mom with other teens or preteens who get it. So you don't have to explain it. They're in the same boat. And so a lot of the shame and stigma would just disappear. Um, so that was huge. That's, that's why I think facilitated programs are vital as opposed to just having access. Okay, quick question. Um, Mona, have you ever worked with any colleges or universities or the correctional system as a whole to publish your curriculum? No, I haven't. I have. What happened, I was so anxious to work that I spent most of my time, you know, looking for an appointment. And I, like, like I said, I, my first experience, I'm always on my second job now, which is at the dental instrument place. So I really never really, I live alone. My bills are like unbelievable. You know, I have a lot of responsibilities that, like, when I, before I left, I had my apartment. I think I paid maybe $300 a month rent. I was paying $1,900 a month when I came home. I just moved. $1,900 a month for rent. That, didn't, that only included hot water, not electric, <laughs> not gas, not, you know, and so it's really hard. I don't have time. I would love it, you know? Just because I work in a correctional facility, and I just think that you're on to something humongous with a piece where starting with your own childhood, your own trauma, your own victimization, whatever that may be, working all the way towards parenthood. That's phenomenal, amazing. But my second question is, how are the rest of the ladies doing? Huh? How are the rest of the ladies doing? They're actually doing pretty good, except for Tanika. Uh, Tanika is still in Albion, and actually I had a very upsetting experience. I went to try to visit her in August with my children because they feel like they know all the women. And um, we were going to Niagara Falls, 
and which was like a gazillion mile drive. And you go right by Albion, which was bizarre. And so I said, hey, do you guys want to go see Tanika? And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we went. And it was really, it was distressing because I, we got there at about 9.30. And just, I won't bore you with the details, but the processing was so slow and I don't know if it was like maliciously slow or it was just a bad day or if it was staffing or whatever was going on but I, we never got in because you have to be inside the gates by 2.30 to have the visit and I'd gotten there at 9.15 which I thought was pretty good given how early we got up to get there um, and the w nice other regular visitors who were there at 8 said you know what you're not going to get they could tell because there were like 30 people ahead of me but it was just an indication of what the families go through on a regular basis um, so Tanika's having a tough time although she's eligible for parole starting in June so she's very focused on that and very hopeful and I hope I mean she's very hopeful I hope for her sake I don't know though I'm worried about that um, Rosa just got out in May and came to her first screening recently and it was amazing and she's bringing Rosa and Joey the boy you saw are coming to a screening at the end of the month uh, Melissa is the one I have the least contact with I think because as you probably can tell from the film she really wanted to put it behind her she just felt like it was a chapter I've moved on I mean I've talked to her a couple of times or several times actually so we chat occasionally and I check in with her um, and she uh, lives separately now she has her own place and seems to be doing well and Anethea is g very good too I just talked to her so yeah all in all you know not life isn't perfect but nobody's back and so, anyway. Um, question, um, and thank you, thank you all again. It was, uh, it, yeah, I'm, I, I'll be telling everybody about this film. <laughs> but how were you able to negotiate um, the filming access? of this, uh, access to this, over that long a period? Tell me about it. Uh, yeah, I and know. how big was your crew? And there had to be some changes in administration. Three different time. wardens. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I know. it's I just a five-year press. How, could, how yeah. were you able to do that? Um, well, well. It, <laughs> I, I, I somehow someone agreed on and off. I got really lucky. I kept asking, asking, asking. No, 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 no. And it went up the chain of command to somebody in Albany. I got in a good day. I don't know. Said okay and kind of greenlit it. And then the prison, unfortunately, was kind of stuck with me. And but I have to say, over time, I think they really came to understand that my motives were. Um, authentic. I, I, you know, the women as well. I think after a while they realized, you know, I really am trying to tell their story as best I can within the confines of, of how I'm working and the um, prison. But they were getting really frustrated by the end. Like they, you know, by they just didn't understand what I was going for. And as I said, you know, when press is allowed into a prison, it's usually an extremely confined situation, very short visit. You know, they stick some bad music underneath it, and it's a two-minute piece. So this idea of kind of following the same people over time, uh, but but I have to give them credit. They let me. They could have. They could have just stopped it. They did let me keep coming in. And part of that is because I really worked hard at the relationships to try to, you know, be as pleasant as I could about the fact that I was messing up. I wasn't a you know inmate. I wasn't a guard. Like they didn't really know where to put me. So it was. Um, I was very fortunate. I got access because I can't tell you how many filmmakers come up to me and say, "How did you keep getting back in?" So. Uh, I was, well, the, the first time they let me in, they gave me such short notice. I had been asking, asking, asking. And then I get a call like on a Thursday saying, okay, well, you can come in on Sunday or Monday. And I was like, what? You know, <laughs> what? And I didn't dare say, well, actually, I don't know if I can get a crew together. Because, so I called my brother. <laughs> so the whole first week of this, which, and, and when, you know, Mona mentioned the screening at Lincoln Center. I, can I tell you the whole, when you watch it with your younger brother who's elbowing you through the whole screening going, oh wow, a lot of my footage got in. Oh wow, didn't, <laughs> di didn't I shoot that? I'm like, yes, you shot that, yes you did. Um, but he, I knew he knew how to operate a camera, and he ha and the poor guy, he was on vacation, he was switching jobs, so he gave up his whole inv vacation to, to shoot inside a women's prison for a week. And uh, he was like used to local news and speedy, and he kept saying, you know, how are we gonna do this? But then after that, I had a sound and camera person and myself, there's three of us. Yeah, and no, and I have to tell you, they really got paid next to nothing. They really, everybody connected to this project did it for, I didn't give myself, I haven't had a salary, and they, um, the, the camera fellow just had done, you know, commercials and videos, and he wanted to do something more meaningful, so. How long are you planning to follow up with the women? 
What do you mean? The women. The women in the film. Oh well, how long? oh, well, I, I think personally I'll keep in touch with them. I don't know. You know, I have, people have asked me that about maybe going back and kind of revisiting it in 10 years. I don't know. I'll think about that. But um, I personally, I think I'll, I'll be in touch with them always. I mean, I, I think Mona will always be part of my life. So. Was it difficult getting the women to agree to the filming? No. <laughs> no, I think, and I think because not, oh, they're not asked very often to talk about their own feelings and emotions, so... Um, I was just very lucky that they were all articulate and, and really wanting to share in an honest way. So, did you, How did you recruit these five particular women? Did they volunteer to be part of the um, screen? They did. You know, it was really close to a random sample, though, I think, as you could get, because I mentioned that they gave me permission kind of on a Thursday um, because I had to choose a week. They said you can do you know, one week uh, during the summer program. And so, and you could only talk to the women who are participating in that program that week. So I think it was 15 women were there. And all the women from the, in the film are from that original group. So it was kind of a random sample. And a few had kids who were very shy, didn't want to be part of it. Um, and Mona actually, her kids had, were grown, so they weren't coming to the the summer program that like it was crafts and for younger kids, but she was running the whole thing. <laughs> and so it became clear when I started watching the footage that Mona was totally a, a, a main you know, char character. Um, and Melissa's baby was too young to participate in the thing, but her parents came to visit every single day, literally every single day, because in Bedford, one positive thing is you can have a visit any day uh, of the week, and so they came every day. So she was always kind of in the visiting area while I was shooting, and I thought I, I really wanted to have a baby. I wanted the nursery to be somehow involved in the film, in the story, and so I just went and introduced myself, and they said, sure. So they were really open and, and very trusting. I, I'm not sure, you know, if someone asked me, could I follow you around with a camera, uh, how I would react. So I'm always kind of amazed that people are, are willing to, to give of themselves that way and, and trust that I was going to do the right thing. We have, we have time for one more question. Wait, wait. You said that you live in Queens now. With it being a life sentence, will you ever be allowed to live anywhere else? Um, fortunately, um, they say in New York State, I have life on the back of me. So they say in New York State, on a little bit of life sentence, you stay on parole for three years, and then you go up for like a review. And I'm, I'm pretty confident that I would be off parole, you know, when that, when that time comes. Um, and I can live, like right now, I, had to get, I have a pass actually in my coat pocket, a travel pass saying I can come here. Um, and that's what normally I would have to do. I'd have to get permission. And, like, I'm not allowed to keep in contact with anybody in prison. Part of my parole stipulation, you ask about the driver of the vehicle, my co-defendant, that's one of my stipulations is, like, no contact with him. I mean, you know, you know I have no ill feelings to, towards him, and I do want him to get out. And, you know, I'm, like, this debate about they know that I'm the only one in possession of my parole record, of my parole transcript. So, like, I'm a little leery about if I give it to his brother and then he does something in court with it and they have that, they're going to know he got it from me. So, like, I'm like, you know, do I risk my freedom because I can get violated for that? So, so they say, like, three years, I should be off. Thank you very, very Thank much. Thank you.